Coming up, the world is a step closer to a new drug to fight sarcoidosis. This is uh, really exciting. It's the final step uh, in a long process. Uh, I've been working on this therapy for the better part of almost seven years now. Efsofitamod, remember that name. Uh, if we're successful in this next trial, uh, this will be, I think, a transformative therapy for sarcoidosis patients. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hi guys, I'm your host, John Carlin, and today I am so pleased and privileged to have as my guest Dr. Sanjay Shukla, CEO of A-Tire Pharma, on this podcast to talk about the most recent and what I would call wonderful development of a drug that we had been tracking here on the Sark Fighter podcast, along with the medical world in general, as A-Tire 1923, now called Efsofitamod, or for short, Efsofit. A-Tire is launching a large study. This is the largest Phase 3 study in 20 years or so in the sarcoidosis space. The trial so far for EFSOFIT has shown promise in reducing the need for steroids while also improving lung function and doing it safely. So people, we are talking literally about groundbreaking stuff here. So three bullet points. As I said, the largest phase three study in 20 years in this space. It'll be the first time if it happens, the FDA has approved the measure of steroid reduction as the main efficacy outcome in a clinical trial of a new treatment for sarcoidosis. And the trial is the latest stage study available for evaluating a new treatment for sarcoidosis. Now, Regular listeners on the podcast here will recognize Sanjay's name because he's appeared in several previous episodes to keep us up to date on the drug as it makes its way through all the testing required to eventually be approved by the FDA if that happens for use by sarcoidosis patients. And the continued testing only happens if the drug continues to succeed in the smaller tests. And so far, to a large degree, it has. And if the outcomes are the way everybody wants, things will be much better for those of us with sarcoidosis. Now, the previous studies have been, as I said, they've been small by comparison in terms of the numbers of patients tested. But now it'll happen on a grander scale. And this does have the potential to be literally a game changer for those of us suffering from this orphan disease where there has not been a lot of emphasis on finding drugs to treat us. Let's face it, sarcoidosis is out there. We, you know, there's 200,000 of us, give or take, in the United States. Uh, there are other ailments and illnesses where there are way more patients there is therefore uh, way more interest in finding drugs to treat them, and not a lot has been done in the sarcoidosis space. Well, along comes a tire and this EFSOFIT drug, and it is looking really good. Uh, I don't want to characterize it beyond what I should, and I certainly don't want to characterize it beyond what Sanjay is willing to do. And the most of this podcast is going to be Sanjay explaining to us exactly where things are, exactly what the potential outcomes could be, what the shortfalls might be, and and what could happen with EFSOFIT. So coming up, Sanjay joins me here and he explains how it all works and how you might actually be able to take part in the test. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter podcast. 
Welcome back to the Stark Fighter podcast. Joining me now is Sanjay Shukla. He is the CEO of Eight Tire Pharma, and they've got some exciting news to share with us today here on the Sark Fighter podcast. Sanjay, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me back on uh, the podcast. So you are ready to move forward with, if people have been listening, with uh, a drug that has been known as A-Tire 1923. And we've talked about that because it's shown some promise. It now, first of all, tell me about it. it has a new name. And what is the status of the drug formerly known as ATAR 1923? Yeah, we've, uh, we've talked in the past uh, at a, on an earlier podcast around a trial <clears throat> that we had uh, run using ATYR 1923 in pulmonary sarcoidosis. Um, and last September, we had some rather outstanding results from that early patient trial in 37 pulmonary sarcoidosis patients. Uh, and I'm sure we'll um, talk a little bit more as a reminder about that, but you're absolutely correct. 1923 has now uh, changed names as we have advanced and are advancing into phase three. Uh, it is now known, uh, we have a uh, uh, more of a, a medical uh, name for it, uh, Fsofitamod, uh, which is something that um, uh, <laughs> we, we didn't pick, uh, it, but uh, it is an immunomodulator and now that it has matured to a late stage trial, uh, that's its new moniker, Epsofitamod. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, compound, uh, the therapy that we are now advancing into a global phase three pulmonary sarcoidosis trial that I know we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, it doesn't get to phase three unless uh, it showed a great deal of promise and safety during the earlier phases. And uh, just for, for the listener's sake, once you get phase three, that's where this becomes uh, a drug that could, be, that could be available for sarcoidosis patients. This is uh, really exciting. It's the final step uh, in a long process. Uh, I've been working on this therapy for the better part of almost seven years now uh, from the initial uh, uh, preclinical uh, research findings where you're looking at things in the laboratory uh, and then you're advancing it into um, some amount of animal testing um, and uh, health then moving to healthy volunteers. Uh, this last study, which uh, took us several years to uh, run, as I said, just read out in 37 pulmonary sarcoidosis patients last July. And since then, we have been engaging primarily with the FDA. And a few months ago, we had some, uh, some great news from the FDA that we've, we've effectively got endorsement now to move into phase three. And phase three represents the final hurdle uh, before a therapy can be approved. So we've reached the, uh, the, the, the finals here, if you will, if you like sports analogies, um, uh, after navigating for the last several years. And uh, we can see, uh, we can see sort of the the the, the shoreline here. We we've, we've, we've swum out really really far. Now we can see the other side, uh, and uh, if we're successful in this next trial, uh, this will be, I think, a transformative therapy for sarcoidosis patients, in particular those patients uh, who who uh, uh, suffer from primarily pulmonary manifestations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so essentially patients would receive an IV once a month. And, uh, and this is what we've seen in the earlier trials. And basically what the drug does is it restores immune balance and regulates inflammation in the lung, which is huge. There, there's not currently a drug on the market targeting sarcoidosis that does that. Correct. We, we designed our earlier trial um, and going back to even some of our research testing, we thought this could be a real potent therapy in controlling inflammation, inflammation of the lung. As we've learned over the uh, better part of the last five years, uh, the therapy seems to be very consistent in down-regulating those inflammatory immune cells that are uh, going haywire in sarcoidosis patients, in particular in the lungs. So the trial we set up was really to look at 
whether or not this drug would benefit patients. And we prioritized uh, things like steroids and reducing steroids. And uh, we were perhaps the first company uh, to uh, prioritize that as a, a real activity endpoint. Um, in our last trial, we asked patients to reduce their steroids as part of the trial. Some got our drug, some didn't. And I really want to acknowledge those patients that uh, did not get our trial because they really played a vital role, these placebo patients, if you will, that even though they didn't get our drug, it showed what kind of detrimental effects to your, say, cough and shortness of breath and fatigue that can occur if you start to get off steroids. Now, we all know how bad steroids are on a host of other things. So as many experts have called it, it's, a, it's kind of a devil's drug. You're making a devil's bargain there. So this was something that we thought about early on. And um, um, as a clinician myself, I just realized how poisonous these, this therapy is. And it's unfair to sarcoidosis patients that they need to make this decision uh, to take steroids. So in our trial, uh, as a reminder, we showed some uh, rather um, uh, outstanding effects to in first reducing steroids, uh, some of our highest dose um, um, groups in that last trial, the five milligram dose in particular, showed we were able to get people off uh, more than half their steroids, 58%. And in fact, several patients were able to effectively uh, eliminate steroids, three out of the nine patients we tested. And it's a small trial, it's small numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these are folks that some of them have been on steroids for some time, a decade or longer. So in a relatively short period of time, we were able to uh, get folks off steroids. Now, what happened to those patients is they also saw symptom improvement. So you're getting off steroids and you're improving symptoms. And that's really important because the end goal here is we want to feel better. We yeah, you, weren't, get... you weren't just allowing them to maintain, get off steroids and maintain and not have a flare, but they got off steroids and started feeling better, which we is should, huge. We saw substantial benefits in the ability to improve your cough, your shortness of breath, your fatigue, your quality of life. Uh, these were things that we knew that if we could get steroids down, we thought we could maintain some things, but we saw more than just maintenance. We saw improvement. Um, and then the other thing that I think I want to highlight here is we also looked at things like lung function, uh, pulmonary function testing. And there we had a surprising benefit that in this six month trial, we also saw uh, pulmonary function tests, testing improving, uh, your force vital capacity, which is what the pulmonologists really pay attention to. And experts have pointed out that we may be the first therapy to show all three that we're reducing steroids, improving symptoms, and improving your lung function. So I'm thrilled uh, at the data from the previous study. This is why uh, the FDA uh, has uh, endorsed our ability to move forward. Uh, and not only here in the U.S., we are going to be uh, looking at this trial in you know, almost 10 countries in Europe and also Japan. So this has a, a chance now a really good chance to be, uh, as I said, uh, a transformative therapy, uh, because we're not just we're not just you know helping a little bit with with the disease. We want to modify the disease. We really want to attack things here. Um, there's other things to still follow up on, whether or not granulomas dissipate, things like that. That might take longer, um, but this is a great start. That if we can um, build upon the success of the last trial. Um, we, we really are, are excited. The drug is the, the, the full name is Efsofitimod. You're just going to call it Efsofit. Am I right about that? The trial is actually uh, named Efsofit. And okay. we named it that because uh, it is a shortened version of Efsofitimod. But we also talked about how um, we're making your lungs more fit. I think many of our team uh, thought that um, we're, 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 we really are um, improving symptoms and lung function. Uh, so our, our clinical operations team has, uh, has uh, branded this trial, the EFSO-FIT trial, 
Uh, and as I said, we're in more than um, looking to get into more than 10 countries. And we are looking to enroll a substantial number of patients. This will be the biggest sarcoidosis trial ever. Yeah, that's what I want to ask you. So why is this, why is this phase three study so significant? And, and in particular, how, you know, how long has it been since a drug has made it this far? In well, terms I would, of, of trying to, you know, find to, to crack the sarcoidosis code. And, and it's been far too long. And I'll maybe highlight a couple therapies like Akthar, which has been, quote unquote, approved, I would say, since maybe the 50s and 60s. It's been grandfathered in. And even though that's the only sort of, I would say, approved therapy, um, it comes with its challenges. Uh, and those that um, benefit from it, that's great. Uh, but this would be the first therapy in the better part of, I would say, the last 50 years. The drugs that are used for sarcoidosis are largely off-label, uh, outside of steroids. And uh, we think that this would, uh, epsilfitamod uh, would have a place as a, uh, perhaps a frontline therapy, uh, first or second line. But that I'll leave that to the experts on how they want to incorporate the therapy but certainly if we are potentially reducing or even replacing steroids, uh, I think that is, um, uh, it's going to play a, a large role in the um, uh, early, early treatment of this disease. So let's move on. What is it uh, designed to investigate when we look at this trial and you know, how many people are going to enroll? Um, what's it designed to investigate and how have you figured out exactly what to measure when you, when you look at this, because you know, you're looking at it, the FDA is looking at it, medical science is excited because it get, it's getting so close, but what are all the, what are all the parameters here? So that's a very important question. And the last trial was, as I said, in 37 patients, and we saw benefits in uh, really almost everything we measured. And let's start with safety. The drug has to be safe um, through, through the course of any drug being developed every step, it has to be safe. Uh, phase one, phase two, phase three. So in healthy volunteers, which is typically say phase one, the drug was deemed safe. In this trial, when we looked at safety, it was deemed safe. The next trial, that is still going to be, we, we have to have that. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to bring a therapy that isn't safe uh, to the market. So that's first and foremost. The second thing is when you think about how do we order and prioritize what's most important uh, to get a drug approved. This is where we have to work and negotiate a little bit. Um, and I use the word negotiate in the sense that we work with worldwide regulators, the FDA, the, uh, the versions of the FDA in Japan, which is called the PMDA. The European authorities have their own versions of the FDA in the United Kingdom, France, Spain, places like that. So we will present our, info, our data, and we will get guidance. The great thing here is there's, there's decent consensus in the worldwide pulmonary sarcoidosis expert, medical expert community that we need a therapy that first improves symptoms and gets people on their way or off steroids. I think that is, that is viewed as something that would be um, two major checkboxes. So when we design this next trial, we take that input and then we, we essentially uh, try to organize our trial in a manner to prioritize uh, the, the endpoints. Those are the, the measures that the regulators want us to um, interrogate in, in, our next, in our next trial. So we have received um, early indications from the FDA that steroid reduction um, uh, is something that should be prioritized. This is viewed by the the regulators as perhaps the most important um, variable for patients and providers. Can you have a new therapy that can replace what is known as a toxic therapy, or at least start to reduce the amount of, say, prednisone everyone has to take every day? So that and, is and something you that have is... Not, you have not been shy about calling prednisone toxic. No, I, I think, it, I think um, uh, anyone that takes it uh, for the, in a chronic, um, for a chronic disease, as many sarcoidosis patients take a prednisone. And I've worked in other conditions like lupus and myasthenia, where um, I just don't think it's good enough 
uh, at this point. And I believe, and I've said this uh, in other forums, that in 50, 60, maybe even less time than that, the medical textbooks will be talking about how, uh, wow, why did they give in the in the you know late 1900s this 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 toxic therapy? This was poison, and we've seen that with other drugs in in the history of medicine. So my view is. Uh, as somebody that has uh, seen a few sarcoidosis patients in my life, that it's unfair. It's unfair that um, patients have to rely upon what I consider a little bit of a toxic, uh, a very toxic drug. Yes, it works well in helping certain aspects of the disease, but this is something that I'm, I'm really encouraged that now even worldwide regulators see as, hey, we, we got to do better. It also, I think, is really, it matters to patients because you know there are therapies out there where uh, if I was talking to a patient and I said, well, this drug improves your force vital capacity by 1.5% over the next couple of months, what does that mean to people? What does that mean to patients? And I think it really can really, it's more meaningful if you can say, look, this, these pills that you take every day, I might be able to cut them down if you take up sofitamide. I might be able to maybe even eliminate them and you're gonna feel better, and you're gonna perform better on some of these other you know, lung function parameters. Um, so our goal was really to make this very patient focused and prioritize what's most important that if this drug sulfidamide is ever a, an approved therapy, it's obvious to the community that, hey, it works. Because it's less obvious if you say, hey, well, there's this lung function test that it works. That's great that we also see that. So steroids reduction is going to be the primary endpoint um, for this trial. A phase three trial, not only has to show shit safety, but it has to show efficacy. Now, now it's time to show, yes, the drug works. And the trial has to be larger because you have to statistically power the trial. And I know this, this can be a little bit boring when you start talking about statistics, but you right. need a large number of patients now to say, okay, the signal you saw in those 37 patients, now we need to see it in a large enough group of patients that we can believe this statistically. So our next trial is going to have, uh, our goal is to enroll 264 pulmonary sarcoidosis patients going up from 37. 264, not 265 and not 263. And some of these are these are based on statistical <laughs> modeling, sure. uh, but essentially what we are doing is we are moving forward with two of our doses, the two higher doses that showed nice effects in our last, last trial, three milligrams of epsilfitamod and five milligrams of epsilfitamod, which will be administered once a month through a uh, one hour IV infusion. And that will be, and then there'll also be a placebo population that is getting a um, an infusion that does not include our drug. And each of those three groups will have 88 patients each. And, that's and, without, okay. and yeah. without, getting, without getting into all of the statistics behind it, this allows us to adequately, if we meet our endpoint, show the FDA and other worldwide leaders that this was not by chance, or we're minimizing the chance finding that the drug works. So, so you've got three different groups. Some will get no dose. Some will get a small dose, and some will get the full dose. And then you'll look at in each of that those groups of eighty-eight people, you'll look at the efficacy and safety of the drug. And then let's say you get the group of eighty-eight people who um, get the full dose. How? What percentage of those eighty-eight people? have to have been deemed a, a success for, for the FDA or for you to look at the drug and say, yup, it works. So um, it's less about, um, uh, so, so this, this can get a little complicated. So for your listeners, I'm going to try to. Uh, yeah, dumb it down for it. I'm not dumb. I'm just going to simplify right. it. Um, That's what I meant. Yeah. First off, I think, you know, the two doses are important to understand that they're both full doses, but we have to be able to look at, does, is three milligrams effective? Is five milligrams, uh, are three and five, first of all, safe? Right. And then if they're both safe, is five that much better than three? Okay. And five and three, those two doses have to obviously be better than 
placebo. Does, does, so, a, big, so does a larger person get more or does that not matter? Or do you no, know? It's, it's, it's typically, it's, uh, it's based by, um, th- there is some weight estimation that goes into it. So it's three milligrams per kilogram. And it's part of how the pharmacy typically will, you know, put in the infusion a sure. certain amount. But what I will tell you is we are looking at steroid reduction. So we will look at these 88 patients and you, would, you might expect that those getting placebo are going to not do well. And we saw that in our previous trial. Uh, folks, while they reduced their steroids, started to get sicker. They coughed more. They had more fatigue, more shortness of breath. Their lung function declined. All the things you might expect, right? If you're a sarcoidosis patient, you start not taking your prednisone, you're going to feel sicker. And we saw that, and we expect that to happen in the, in the 88 patients. Um, mm-hmm. Now, how sicker they get, this is where we have to sort of um, theorize and work with the experts to say, here's what's predicted. Then what we have to do is we have to predict how much benefit are we going to see or how much, for example, steroid reduction are we going to see in the other two groups? Um, and this is where we then, at the end of the trial, look at the differences. So, for example, in the last trial, we saw, relatively sp- speaking, a uh, 20 to 25% difference in those six months between the amount of steroids that those on Epsilon needed and those on placebo. And the lines trended in you know, those receiving our drug started to trend well, and those not trended poorly. Now, this trial is going to be a one-year trial, so you might expect further differences. And when you show those differences, that's where you run statistics around that, and then the FDA determines, yeah, that is a significant difference. It's, it's not by chance. Now, at the same time, we also want to see symptoms improve. So that's going to be a major second endpoint that it doesn't do us any good to get people off steroids if their symptoms aren't improving. Right. So I think that's the other thing here, that the drug, you should be able to see differences between the groups that those getting drug uh, improve and have better symptoms. And those who who are on placebo and reducing those, the, the steroids, they should get worse. So these are the sorts of things that we start to look at differences and, you might also want to see that five does better than three because you're giving more. It should, and that's called a dose response. And we saw that in our last trial. Mm-hmm. Our, our, our three milligram population did better than placebo and five did better than three. Gotcha. The reason why we have both in the next trial is, <clears throat> you know, there, there's reasons that regulators say, hey, can you just show me that again in a bigger trial now? Um, and, and, you know, uh, assuming both, both therapies are safe and you see that magnitude of effect, it allows them to then advise to say five milligrams should be approved. Uh, There can be a chance three milligram gets approved if, you know, a regulator wants to take a more conservative view, uh, maybe the, the, the benefits are similar. And then you say, well, I can get still the same amount of efficacy improvement on a lower dose. So that's okay. Let's just do that. And this happens all the time with therapies where they look at what is the, the sort of safest, minimally, uh, minimally administered dose that is also maximally effective. Effective. Sure. Where and, the lines and, cross. And we do this, we do this with all kinds of therapies, um, hypertension drugs, for example, you know, why, why give 16, 60 milligrams or something if we can still get the same benefit on 20. Um, so, that's a that's maybe a longer answer than your viewers would want, but uh, the point here is um, we are looking to replicate some of the findings that we saw in thirty seven patients and um, prove it now in a in a larger trial um, of two hundred sixty four patients, which will also be longer. It will be a one year trial, not a six month trial. So so now so and it's not easy to find two hundred sixty four people to participate. And you're doing this in multiple countries and the United States at various medical centers. So who will be involved with this? How would somebody uh, become a, would, do you approach them? Do they approach you? How, do, how does that work? How do, and, and nobody knows which dose they're getting. Right. And 
I'll answer that last part. Um, that needs to, see, this is the difficult thing, I think, in, in clinical trials. I really admire those patients that sacrifice their time, effort, and energy to participate in this kind of research. So let's start by saying, whatever happens here, we are going to learn a whole lot about sarcoidosis because 264 patients worth of data is going to be the largest trial ever in sarcoidosis, in, 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 in a clinical trial. Um, so the experts are gonna learn a lot. And we have been approached by more than 70 hospitals around the world who wanna participate. So they are the funnel, they, they are the entry point for patients to, to get involved in this trial. We, of course, as a small company in San Diego, we, we can't um, manage 70 centers. So we work with partners, uh, clinical research organizations, that allow us to uh, enroll patients in all of these areas. We also have ourselves a tire partnership with a company in Japan, Kyorin, that is our partner there that believes that sulfidamide could benefit Japanese patients. And they will be the company that if this drug is approved in Japan, they will handle the, 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 um, the drug uh, on the market in Japan. But how do we, how do we organize this trial? Our data was presented, for example, at a recent major medical conference, the American Thoracic Society. We garnered interest from not only the sarcoidosis experts, but there's also pulmonologists who may not be specifically experts in sarcoidosis, but they have um, interest in, in a patient population, say in France or uh, say in um, you know, a part of the U.S. we weren't previously in L.A. You know, uh, we, we had one center there. We may have multiple now centers, uh, uh, you know, um, um, Kentucky, Berm uh, Alabama, Georgia. And just increase the number of centers is a way to bring in more patients. But I also think that the data that we presented has created a lot of excitement with patients who want to participate. So we're hopeful that that helps us with enrollment, but this will be a challenge because it will be a big task for us to basically um, work with now instead of say 10, 12 hospitals that we worked with in our last trial, we're working with seven times more and um, we're gonna rely on patients, those hospitals uh, and our partners globally uh, to help us recruit for this trial because it is going to be a, um, um, a daunting task, but I'm encouraged by even recently in San Francisco when we presented this medical data, we had experts from around the world, even some countries that right now we have not sort of targeted as uh, where we might go, but we had experts from Brazil, we had experts from India who said, I really like these results um, that you're, you're presenting here. Um, I'd be thrilled if you would consider, you know, bringing this experimental therapy uh, you know, to our region. But um, wow. so these, this, this is kind of where we are and we have to see how we, how we do here, but it's going to require all of us to marshal all of our resources and, um, and time, um, you know, to, to enroll, enroll this study. It's, I mean, it's going to be hard to find uh, 260 Four, 68, yeah, 264. 264. Yeah. It's going to be hard to find 264 people, even with all of that going on. So how long, how long will it take to launch the study and, and do it and then evaluate the results? So we are launching this study um, this quarter, this in these next couple months here. Okay. Um, I would anticipate our first patient will be, um, uh, enrolled and dosed, um, you know, in this study, um, in the, in the very, very near future. And as it's a one year study now, so we're not just looking at six doses, we're looking at 12. When that 264th patient is enrolled, you have to add a year to that, at least that. You know, maybe a little bit of time after that for me, for us to look at the data and then get it out to the experts. But Right now, we're looking at, based on our uh, analysis on how we did on our previous trial, that it's going to take at least um, a year, maybe 15 months, to get 264 patients in the door at 70 centers. And remember, all 70 centers don't turn uh, the lights on right away. They don't open their doors immediately. It takes 
time to build for that. So that's something that I'll probably want to come back to you, John, and maybe give you updates as we go. But the game plan here, and I know this can also be frustrating to a lot of patients, it takes time. Science and research take time. So our last study, we embarked on it uh, back in the 2019, 2020 time point, and we just had the readout in 2022. So this trial, if you think about, it's going to require at least a year, maybe maybe slightly longer to enroll, and then a year to after that to kind of get the final readouts. Uh, we are looking at um, you know late 2024 right now for to have that data, uh, and this is why this is why it takes sometimes a long time for drugs to get approved. Um, but I'm proud as, you know, uh, we're, we're proud at ATIRE that we are one, we are the leading company right now for sarc uh, a potential sarcoidosis therapy. So we're small, but mighty. And we have a lot of great other companies getting involved. Uh, we think we are shining a light on sarcoidosis. And some of those companies are much bigger than us. They're thousands of times bigger than us, you know, very large pharmaceutical companies based in, in New Jersey and Switzerland and France. These are huge conglomerates. Uh, they're behind us right now. Um, we are moving into phase three. And uh, as I said, we can see the, the sort of the promise. We can see the shore. We can see the peak here. You know, we're climbing a big mountain here, but uh, I can see the summit. If we can get there, um, I think it will be a um, tremendous accomplishment for not just ATIRE, but for all of us, because it takes the community to also mobilize uh, and, 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 and get there. When you and I first started speaking, and this is, this is the, I want to say the third time that you've appeared as a primary guest on the podcast, and you've also been on as a panelist with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Um, but way back when, this was just kind of an idea that was showing some efficacy. I don't want to call it a shot in the dark, but can you kind of describe how, like how the odds have changed as this thing has progressed? Sure. I mean, when you look very, very early in drug research, you, you look at how things do it in a Petri dish or in a test tube. And you basically at that sort of early <clears throat> stage, you're looking at, just the chemistry and you're looking at things um, in, in, as I said, in, in almost like a Petri dish, does something change here? If I put this therapy in with immune cells that are activated, that are haywired, does something improve? And that's something that I observed early on going back to 2016, 2017 with this therapy. From there, we advanced to look at what might it do in rodents, in mice. In, in, and there we presented data that in some of those animal um, models, we saw the drug do a nice job of tamping down inflammation. And um, then from there, we also did some testing as you typically would do in, in um, uh, monkeys. Uh, to look at safety, because we are most related as a species to monkeys. So uh, sure. these are the things that you have to do before you even put it into humans to make right. sure. And, and and back safe. then, so it's like, like, like one in a thousand chance that, that this it, thing might work? It, at that, at back then, yeah, you're getting into sort of, that's probably a fair number. You know, right. back then, that's where we were. Now, every time you advance and you start to show okay, it's doing something in animals. It seems to be safe in animals. You're lowering, you know, your odds get better and better and better. And compared to where we, where we were back then, I would say we're now close to a coin flip. So, and I know that's going to sound a little bit um, perhaps um, uh, outlandish to say that, but this has to do with drugs that typically reach phase three you know, are, you're kind of all, almost in that coin flip, you know, uh, you're almost 50-50 at that point. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many hurdles you have to get through. At any point of the journey, whether in animals or in even early healthy volunteers, or even in this last study, you could find some kind of 
uh, signal, a safety signal. Things we looked at was, for example, is this is our therapy, Epsilon making you more susceptible to infection? Because you know it's down, it's 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 tamping down your immune system. Right. Um, is it making any other adverse events worse? We didn't see that. Uh, in fact, we saw less adverse events in general compared to placebo. Most of the adverse events we saw in the last trial were on placebo, and most of them had to do with sarcoidosis, cough, wheezing, shortness. Breath. So you say to yourself, okay, this all makes sense. But as we advance, we bring down that, as you say, one to 1,000, down to one to 500, one to 250. And I would say we're getting closer to now a coin flip here uh, that um, if this therapy um, can get through this last hurdle, um, we, will, we will have made it. Um, but but it is it is a daunting task, um, and I think it 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 is something that I'm really proud that you know to even get this far, um, um, you know, for Asafirma. There's got to be a lot of people listening right now, and even people who aren't listening who um, really want you to succeed with this and, and want want you to be able to bring it to market and and get them some relief. Um, and then, and then even, even then you start looking at, okay, so now I'm, I'm personally in that group of people that has neuro SARC. Well, will it reduce the inflammation in my neuro SARC as opposed to a pulmonary patient? And I know it's way too early to start asking those kinds of questions, but, um, one would hope that there might be some efficacy down the road for the rest of us as well. And, and, and that is typically also another way. Uh, drugs when they, you know, get, let's get the drug on the market and then let's look to expand it. So you look at other therapies that have been useful, for example, in, I'll use an example of a drug, say in psoriasis and the drug gets approved. Um, in that case, uh, it's a drug called Cosentix. Um, uh, uh, and then once it's on the market, you start to look at, Hey, can it also help other patients with psoriatic arthritis? Can it help patients with ankylosing spondylitis? You know, two other very rare. And then what happens is, yes, you show some benefit there. And then now you start to then see it's approved for multiple things. Uh, you talk about neurosarc, cardiac sarc. There could be signals we can learn from this trial. But I think that's something that if we're in a position that we are asking those questions in the future, it's going to be a happy day for all of us because then we will, we'll be able to, I mean, that would be the first thing that might occur to sarcoidosis experts to say, okay, how might now this benefit some of my, my other patients who have more than just pulmonary symptoms? I, um, interviewed, I interviewed a woman yesterday for a future podcast and she has just been diagnosed, but she's got it in her spleen. She's got neurosarc. She's got it primarily in her lungs. Um, so I guess if somebody like that, who is primarily a pulmonary patient is in your study, would you even look and say, Oh, look at her spleen. It's uh, there's improvement there. Or is that, or is that just diluting the research to the point where it's not valuable anymore? Well, you have to remember there might not be, um, adequate numbers for us to make a, you know, again, a statistical uh, inference of that. You, you, an you, anecdotal you, you may find it, you may find anecdotal benefit. Um, you know, what I've been taught by the sarcoidosis experts is 80, 90% of all SARC patients have some kind of lung manifestation. They, it's, so it, it makes sense that, um, if we see benefits in the lung, it could potentially help. Uh, I, our current experiment isn't built that way because we're trying to address the, I would say the, what's viewed as maybe the major complication uh, or the major organ that's affected in, in sarcoidosis patients. But um, I think it's, it's, it's a good question to ask. We may see some anecdotal benefit. Um, we have to be careful about you know, some of the criteria is skewed a little bit more to pulmonary patients uh, in this trial, because sometimes patients with neuro or cardiac SARC have to take additional medications. And, and then you start to be, you start to ask, well, which one is helping? Is it Epsilfitamod or that other? So there's, 
it's difficult to to maybe um, get into get into this uh, 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 in, 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 a, in a short um, discussion here, but focusing in on also where the drug seems to have its most effective benefit. If this can be as one day part of the toolkit to say, hey, this is going to help your lungs for sure. That's, I think, a great starting point. I can't tell your listeners right now whether or not it's going to help their cardiac or neural SART. And it would be unfair if I said, yeah, I might, you know, we have to test it. And I think anytime new drugs come, um, you know, down, down the uh, pathway here of development, uh, you have to sort of systematically look at certain things. Um, I can tell you that other interstitial lung diseases that are other lung diseases, fibrotic lung diseases like sarcoidosis, we have data there. So you look at patients, for example, who have scleroderma or rheumatoid arthritis, and now they have lung symptoms. It is similar, different than sarcoidosis, but they present similarly in the sense that a lot of cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, their lungs are becoming fibrotic. They have to get steroids. There's other diseases like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, you think about kids who are vaping, all of a sudden their lungs start to become fibrotic because they have a, um, they're inhaling a toxin. What do they need? They need steroids uh, because they're coughing, they have fatigue. And, and our drug seems to have found a sweet spot, at least from a mechanism point of view of calming down those immune cells that tip people over to become fibrotic. Could it be beneficial in other, you know, anytime you show any kind of steroid sparing benefit, many experts, I was with an expert last week in Virginia who said, I'd love to try this in maybe my pulmonary fibrosis patients because I can't give them steroids. But um, it holds a lot of promise right now. Let's, my focus is really sarcoidosis and specifically pulmonary sarcoidosis right now uh, and getting these patients um, enrolled into this, into this next trial. If somebody is listening to this and they are all in and they want to go participate, what do they do? Where do they start? How do they get going? So our study is on clintrials.gov as many, most clinical trials, you can find them on clintrials.gov. It's, it's run um, through, through the government. And, and this tells you, at least in the U.S., and it will also probably show you the centers that we are planning to, that we have activated or planning to activate. I will say um, the last trial had notable centers that many of you, your listeners may even attend, the Cleveland Clinic, um, University of Cincinnati, Northwestern, National Jewish, University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, Fairfax and Nova outside DC. So we had uh, uh, UT Southwestern in Dallas. So this is where the sarcoidosis experts in the US yeah. primarily are. This next trial will probably double up and have 30 sites in the US. So we'll expand to other parts of the country that maybe we weren't in Florida, South Florida, LA. Um, uh, um, we, we will be active um, Philadelphia, you know, we're, we're still building that network, Minnesota. Uh, these are places that we will work with those centers. Um, so cleantrials.gov is, is a way to learn more about our trial. You can also go to ATIRE's website and we can then guide you to uh, perhaps the, the best regional center. Um, we also have ways to, to uh, work with our partners to um, if, if you work with a physician to get referred to a major center, um, you know, in North Carolina, last time we worked with Eastern Carolina, this time we may have more centers on the Western uh, side of the state, um, closer to where you are, John, um, you know, hoping to get um, some experts from Richmond, um, um, perhaps on board. Uh, Cause there's excellent, there's excellent docs all over the country. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they'll look at our data and, and they've decided, hey, I, I think I want to get involved. So uh, those are the two, I think, easiest ways for your listeners if they are interested. Um, and of course, they're going to have to qualify. Um, they're going to have to be evaluated. Um, and it is a commitment as well. But uh, I'm stressing that again, because in rare disease drug, drug, unlike hypertension or diabetes, where there's just a lot, of, unfortunately, a lot of us dealing with those conditions. In rare disease, the patient community um, plays such a huge role in getting new drugs approved because there, there are not that many 
um, folks in, you know, obviously it's rare. Right. And, and you still have the same, unfortunately, um, um, you know, hurdles from a statistical point of view, things like that to show that this, something is really happening here. Sometimes in ultra, ultra rare conditions where maybe just a handful of people have uh, a disease or a disorder, you'll have the FDA think about it differently. Uh, but um, uh, I'm excited to, to get started here. And, and um, if, if, if folks are interested, those are two uh, ways to, to approach. Also, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is also uh, partnered with us and, and has been just great to work with out of Chicago. Uh, so, so they're also um, um, another avenue that can point you uh, perhaps to the closest center uh, wherever you are worldwide. Excellent. Excellent. Sanjay, thank you so much. Uh, Sanjay Shukla with ATIR, the CEO, for uh, sharing really what is um, earth-shattering, groundbreaking research that's about to start. And, and a lot of folks are going to hear about it here first on the Sark Fighter podcast. So I appreciate you uh, choosing this avenue to get some of the information out to the sarcoidosis community. Well, thank you again, John. And um, thanks. Thanks. Uh, also go out to the community that they are our key, key partner here. And um, uh, we're going to we're going to get to work here on this next trial. And um, I'll be happy to come back and keep you posted on the progress. Very good. Thank you. Just feeding that stumbling. So thanks to Dr. Sanjay Shukla, not, not only for joining me here, but for being a champion for the cause of finding a therapy that could open many doors for people fighting sarcoidosis. So now begins the search for the 264 patients who will enroll in the study and then for clinicians to follow their progress or potentially the lack of it and to measure the safety and effectiveness of EVSOFIT. That'll take a little time. As Sanjay said, this is a 12-month study for each patient, and hopefully the drug will show that people can not only reduce the need for steroids, a victory in itself, but also show improvement in lung function at the same time, which would be a double bonus, and of course do it safely because if it doesn't do all of these things safely then the drug will will potentially never see the light of day now dr sanjay shukla has promised to keep me posted and i will do the same for you i'm in semi regular contact with him and we will see how things go so please stay tuned to the sark fighter podcast and of course uh, all the uh all of the ways that you can potentially participate will be in the show notes, uh, even as Sanjay mentioned those websites, but I'll make it easy. I'll put a link in the show notes, and let's just hope that EFSOFIT lives up to its potential promise. Keep your fingers crossed. Until next time, keep fighting. Learn to suffer. Hey.